Haven Arrest Missionary Baptist Church, Sunday School Lesson number 11, Sunday, February 12, 2017. The lesson is entitled Delivered from Bondage. The lesson comes from Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 through 20. We were asked to read Galatians 4, verses 1 through 31. The place is Syrian Antioch. The time is probably 48 AD. To be a slave is to be cheated out of much of one's life and to have one's personality subverted to the will of another. There is still slavery of many kinds throughout the world. The worst form of slavery is spiritual slavery, slavery to wrong spiritual principles instead of freedom in Christ. If this week's lesson through God's grace enables you to help someone enter into the freedom he can have in Christ, you can count yourself and the person blessed indeed. You may enter into his freedom more fully as well. We are not free to sin and do that which our Lord does not approve. We are free to unconditionally love others and help them in any positive way we can. We are free to act toward others in the ways the Lord Jesus did in his earthly ministry, helping, healing, loving, and bringing the good news of the gospel to as many as we can. Today's aim, facts to see clearly our freedom in Christ. Principle, to realize that we can choose to enter into the freedom Christ has brought for us. Application, to recognize that when we know, understand, and practice true freedom in Christ, we will be blessed greatly and also be a blessing to others. Illustrating the lesson, the pool of previous practices can be difficult to us as believers. Practical points. One, we should give honor and allegiance only to God, Galatians 4, 8. Two, like the prodigal son, we should realize that our father has all we need, Galatians 4, 9, Luke 15, 17. Three, there is a tendency in our fallen human nature to return to those things that held us in bondage, Galatians 4, 9 through 12. Four, even those who know the truth can get off track in their Christian walk, verses 13 through 16. Five, zealousness, though a good quality, can be misdirected to the wrong ends, verses 17 through 18. Six, spiritual oversight can be a challenging and frustrating task for those called to ministry, verses 19 through 20. Golden text, but now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, have turned ye again to the weak and beggary elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. Galatians 4, 9. Today we have two lesson outlines. One, the Galatians problems coming from Galatians 4, 8 through 11. And two, the apostles plea, Galatians 4, 12 through 20. Introduction. It was the Apostle Paul who set forth in his writings to Timothy and Titus the qualifications for the church's leaders, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13, Titus 1, 5 through 9. Conspicuously absent from those biblical qualifications are several traits churches today especially seem to prize. Qualities such as dynamic personality, eloquent speaking ability, and even an attractive appearance. The biblical qualifications for leadership focus on character and faithfulness to God's word. Paul knew from experience how important these qualities are. For no matter how impressive one presents himself to others, if he does not speak the truth and does not back his message with godly character, there will be no positive long-lasting results from his ministry. The Apostle Paul not only proclaimed the truth, he also lived it. That is why he could appeal effectively to the wayward Galatians. He was not the most impressive man, but they knew he spoke the truth, was sincere and genuinely cared about them, in contrast to those who were leading them astray. The Galatians problem. Galatians 4, 8. How be it then, when ye knew not God, did ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods? Verse 9. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, 
how turn ye again to the weak and beggary elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. Verse 10, ye observe days and months and times and years. Verse 11, for verse 11, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Paul's letter to the Galatians was accustomed by confusion in the churches of this modern province in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. False teachers known as Judaizers had introduced the idea that Christians must observe the Mosaic law, contradicting, contradicting Paul's teaching, the book of Galatians in Paul's response to this error. They had forgotten their previous spiritual bondage, Galatians 4.8. At the root of the Galatians' confusion was their failure to grasp their own spiritual history. Here Paul was speak, speaking specifically to the Gentile converts in the Galatian churches. The apostle took them back to the time when they did not know the true God at all. They had worshipped so-called gods that were nothing more than man-made images. In fact, they did service to them, meaning they were enslaved to them, forever doing works that could offer no assurance of salvation. Their religion was their own creation, so there was no way they could be sure their worship was right, adequate, or acceptable. Similarly, the Jewish believers had previously been enslaved to law-keeping, having perverted it into the way of salvation in place of faith. Similar to our, similar to our millions of people today, who slavishly follow practices they or others have created in the groundless hope of making themselves acceptable to God. They were returning to a new form of spiritual bondage, Galatians 4, 9 through 10. Having reminded his readers of their previous enslavement to hopeless rituals, Paul then pointed out that they had been freed from this bondage by coming to know God. To know God is to be born again to the eternal life through faith in Christ, John 17, 3. This had occurred when the Galatians had responded in faith to the preaching of the gospel. Paul was quick to elaborate on this, however, stating that their coming to know God was not merely a matter of their effort, but a work of God himself. They were known of God, Galatians 4, 9. That is, he had chosen them and graciously acted to bring them to faith and salvation. The sad irony, irony was that these Galatian believers who had been delivered from the terrible bondage to pagan gods were now being influenced by false teachers to enslave themselves again to weak and useless principles. The elements mentioned in Galatians 4.3 are called weak and beggary. Here in verse 9, they were weak in that they had no power to rescue man from condemnation. These elements were beggary or impoverished and thus unable to provide the spiritual wealth that only Christ can give. What were these elements to which the Galatians were turning? Our text tells us they involve the observance of days, months, times, and years. These were Jewish celebrations, Sabbaths, feasts, and other special days established by the law of Moses. It is likely that this list is representative of all the Jewish religious practices the Judaizers were proclaiming as incumbent on followers of Christ. It was not that merely observing some of Israel's feasts was wrong, Rather, it was the idea that such practices were required of believers to gain or maintain their acceptance by God that was wrong. This was replacing faith with legalistic practices. It is not so much the outward acts that are important, but the inward attitudes. If the reason we do certain things is that we think we will gain us some spiritual advantage before God, we are legalists. Abandoning God's grace for our own righteousness and abandoning liberty to return to slavery. They were discounting Paul's teaching and work. Galatians 4.11 Paul's letter to the Galatians turned more personal at this point. He expressed the fear that all his labor among the Galatians would be in vain if they followed the legalistic teaching of the Judaizers. If those who had come to Christ through faith 
were our own righteousness and abandoning liberty to return to slavery. They were discounting Paul's teaching and work. Galatians 4.11 Paul's letter to the Galatians turned more personal at this point. He expressed the fear that all his labor among the Galatians would be in vain if they followed the legalistic teaching of the Judaizers. If those who had come to Christ through faith, whether Jews or Gentiles, continued to observe Jewish ceremonies under the impression that they conferred some spiritual benefit, Paul's labors to establish churches in Galatia based on the gospel of salvation by faith in Christ would have been for nothing, for the churches would be abandoning the principle of grace and would be turning to a system of righteousness by works which has never saved anyone. The Apostles plea, verse 12, brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. Verse 13, ye know how through affirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. Verse 14, and my temptation which was in my flesh ye despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Verse 15, where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Verse 16. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Verse 17. They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that ye might affect them. Verse 18. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you. Verse 19. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again, unto Christ be formed in you. Verse 20. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Based on their previous acceptance of him, Galatians 4, 12 through 15, with the very real danger that the Galatians might fully turn to Jewish legalism, the Apostle Paul pleaded with them to embrace Christ alone and to walk by faith rather than put themselves under the law. The law was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Chapter 3, verse 24. The Galatians had been justified by faith, but many were now dropping out of the school of grace and enrolling in the kindergarten of law. Because Paul was a man of utmost integrity and by God's grace had conducted himself in a pure and upright manner among the Galatians, he could appeal to them on the basis of his past experience with them. He urged them, be as I am, for I am as ye are, Galatians 4.12. This expression is probably better understood if we translate it literally. Become like me, for I also became like you. When Paul had come to the Galatians, he had not come as one who was enslaved to Jewish legalism. He had lived like one of them, a Gentile, who was not burdened by the law. Now that some of them were being influenced to turn from grace to the law, Paul urged them to be like him, free from the law, through faith in Christ and living in the grace and freedom that Christ gives. Paul reminded the Galatians that they had not harmed or wronged him when he was among them. The Galatians had found no fault with him for living free from the law and teaching justification by faith. In fact, when Paul had preached the gospel in Galatia, he had done so while experiencing an infirmity of the flesh. Galatians 4.13. Yet the Galatians had welcomed him. They had not yielded to the temptation to despise or reject him, but had received him as an angel of God. Verse 14. Those who believed his message treated him even as they would have received Christ himself. Paul did not say what his infirmity was or why it presented a temptation to the Galatians to reject him. 
The physical weakness could have been malaria, a serious eye problem, or the continuing effects of persecution. The Greeks in general valued a speaker's appearance and delivery almost as much as the content of his speech. And even when Paul might have been healthier, his bodily presence was considered weak. 2 Corinthians 10.10. 10. The Galatians, however, were not put off by his appearance. In view of the Galatians' past acceptance of the apostle, Paul asked where their joy or sense of being blessed was now. The joy they had experienced through faith in Christ was no longer evident. They had turned from the grace of God to legalism and consequently had turned from the one who had delivered to them the truth of the gospel. Paul reminded the Galatian believers that they had loved him and rejoiced in the message he brought them so much that they would have plucked out their own eyes if they could have given them to Paul to help him. Paul apparently had poor eyesight. He often used a secretary to compose his books, Romans 16.22. When he did write, he used large letters in his printing, Galatians 6. 11. This may have been the infirmity Paul wrote of in Galatians 4.13. The joy of salvation through faith in Christ had caused them to fully accept Paul and made them willing to do anything for him. But that joy now was fading away as false teaching was bringing them again into sorrowful bondage. Based on his faithful teaching, Galatians 4.16-18, Paul then asked, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? The false teachers who were pushing their doctrines in Galatia had impugned Paul's integrity. At least by implication, they suggested that he had been insincere and had not taught the truth. Paul had responded to the situation in Galatia by issuing strong condemnations of the false teachings. Verse 1 Chapter 1, verse 6 through 9, Paul's forceful teaching of the truth, both in the past in delivering the gospel to the Galatians and in the present in countering error, did not make him their enemy as the Judaizers suggested. Indeed, the Galatians, the Galatians had accepted him in the past and as their friend, recognizing the truth of his message and the integrity of his character. Paul had spoken the truth to them, but sadly, they were now listening to those who told them lies. Galatians 4.17 To zealously act means to eagerly desire or seek. The, the expression can be used in either a positive or a negative sense. Here it speaks of the false teachers eagerly seeking to carry favor with the Galatians, ostensibly being deeply concerned about them. The motives of the Judaizers, however, were not honorable. In fact, Paul said their goal was to isolate or exclude the Galatians from all other influences, and no doubt Paul in particular. Their hope was that they would gain the trust of the young believers so that they would seek after the Judaizers and adopt their teachings. Paul was quick to acknowledge that it is good to be eagerly sought out for a good purpose. Paul himself had sought the best interests of the Galatians by preaching the gospel. He wished only that their loyalty to the gospel of grace had continued when he was no longer in their presence. Sadly, it seemed they not only had turned away from Paul, but also were departing from the truth. Based on his desire for them, Galatians 4, 19 through 20. As Paul concluded this very personal section of Galatians, he addressed the believers as his little children. He was their spiritual father, but he adopted maternal language in saying he had experienced the pains of their birth into God's family as he preached the gospel. Now he was experiencing similar pain and seeing them falter in their faith and turn from the truth. That pain would continue as he sought to correct them and until Christ was formed in them. The word translated formed, Galatians 4.19, refers to an inner transformation to which the outward conduct should, cor should correspond. The Galatians were believers, so Christ lived in them. 
Colossians 1 27 what was in what was needed was a display of the characteristics which their new life in Christ should have been producing maturity in the faith rather than vacillation or toying with the legalism is the form which Christians should display this was Paul's desire for them and it would come about only when they fully embraced the grace of God and abandoned works of the law as a means of gaining or maintaining their relationship with God. Paul concluded by expressing his desire to be present with the Galatian Christians again. He frankly acknowledged his doubts about them, for he did not know how much of the Judaizing heresy they really had embraced. He could not know for sure until they responded to his letter or he saw them in person. But his hope was to see them again and be able to speak to them in a different tone of voice because they had heeded his warnings and turned fully to the truth he had preached to them. This portion of Galatians had, has important lessons for us today. First, it reminds us of the critical importance of living by faith, not giving in to the perpetual temptation to base our relationship with the Lord on works. Second, it illustrates how important personal integrity is in serving the Lord. Paul's appeal to the Galatians would have lacked a great deal of weight had he not been able to point to his commitment to preaching the truth out of sincere concern for the Galatians and his selfless desire for their salvation and growth. Finally, this passage warns us against those who desire and demand our soul allegiance. Godly leaders will gladly point us to others who can also help us grow spiritually. They will not isolate us from others and suggest that they alone possess the truth. Questions. One, what characterized the Galatians' previous religious experience? Two, in what way did the Galatians show a desire to again be in bondage? Galatians 4.9. Three, what was wrong with observing Jewish religious celebrations? Four, what fear did Paul have with regard to the Galatians? Five, how did Paul conduct himself among the Galatians? Six, how had the apostle been received by them? Seven, what temptation had the Galatians resisted regarding Paul? Eight, how did the false teachers make Paul into the Galatians' enemy? Nine, how did the motives of Paul and the Judaizers differ? Ten, what was Paul's desire for the believers in Galatia? This concludes our Sunday School lesson for Sunday, February 12, 2017. Thank